statement. In the meantime, I would like to explain or say a few words about how you get uh, a request running with LabDo. Because from the auditorium, there were several persons contact me and asking, can I take a laptop? Um, we have a certain procedure as uh, uh, LabDo. First, you have to claim for a laptop. You have to fill in about half a page of information in any language, English, French, German, whatever you want. And this is um, put in out into our database. So we publish your project when it is acceptable um, on our website. And from that moment, any LabDo helper, helper can contribute. So even if a project was accepted in Germany, you can contact a helper in New York or Madrid or Barcelona or Rome. Uh, if there is a friend of your uh, visiting Europe or other countries, he can claim for a laptop or two and bring it to your project. So the idea is that we use the internet and distributed processes. You will hear about that later in the afternoon by Jordi. But um, when you come here the first time, we are not able to give you a laptop if there is no request, no accepted request. We can work on that tomorrow. So especially tomorrow we have time, it's not such a straight schedule as today. And then you can explain about our project and we can, if uh, you have all information available, we can create your project. I'm not sure we can give everybody a laptop uh, when he returns, but we will work on that. We will see. Just to answer all your questions because there were several asking me what is possible and to explain about the process. Okay, thank you. So next is Thompson, as I said, even more important than as I am. Möchtest du das? Alles klar. So, hello. As Ralph mentioned, I'm uh, from the technical side of this project. Um, and uh, I am a repairman here in um, Mülheim. Ah, danke. <laughs> here, here in Mülheim. And uh, if any of the laptops of the PCs uh, needs some service, I will do it here in Mülheim. So uh, one thing we sometimes have is we get a donation from a laptop and there's a big problem on it or in it or something is not there. It's very simple, it's something missing. Some spare parts are not there. In this case, there's a hole in the housing. Yes? You can leave it open, mm, not so good. Um, you can have some other solutions yeah if you work somewhere in the medical service you might you do this yeah take some uh, placer cover over it and it's closed yeah if you're a housewife or a houseman you can take some cardboard very nice you can see what you had to dinner last day that's yeah, for the microwave oven or if you are a handyman you can say okay i made it a little bit better i take the cardboard and put some gaffer tape on it and so it's nice and black but it doesn't really work. Yeah? It's cardboard and it would burn. It's too hot on the side of the laptop. So what we really need is a professional solution. And this is simply uh, a self-printed cover. Yeah? We, we make a model of, of uh, the part we need. And so we can make uh, our spare parts by ourselves. So what do we need? Of course, we need a 3D printer. Yeah. Uh, we bought one for, I think, around about uh, 400 uh, euros. It's uh, one of the better ones. Yeah. And uh, we had made some ad additions to it to get it closed because there are some emissions when you print with a 3D printer. And so we have to close it and build an exhaustion system. We else need something to print. It's plastic and it's sold in, uh, uh, in a version called filament. It's simply a string of plastic on a roll. And uh, it is, uh, there are different kinds of um, filaments around you can use. The one that is often used is the PLA. Uh, this is uh, yeah, the one where you can print with the easiest way, but it has a big problem. It's only stable until 60 uh, degrees Celsius. Yeah? If you get a part where it's hot inside of the laptop, this thing will melt away. The next thing you can use is PET-G. Don't uh, force me to say this word here in... Oops, sorry.
don't force me to say this here in, in, in English, <laughs> I don't know how to, but it's stable until 80 degrees, so that's a little bit better and it's easier to print, um, but 80 degrees are not, uh, it's, it's not good enough for us, for, for our purpose. Maybe uh, we send this uh, laptop to Africa and if it's on the transport way in a hot car or something else, this could be uh, become instable, the part we made, and so we deliver a part that's uh, uh, yeah, that's broken when it's arrived is its uh, uh, destination. So what we do is we use ABS. That's uh, plastic that's uh, yeah, stable until 105 degrees, so this is okay. But it has uh, a big drawback. It needs an exhausting system. You cannot use it in a closed room because the emissions are not healthy. If you inhalate it, you might get some problems. Of course, you need some software. In our case, we need FreeCAD because simply it's uh, open source software. With uh, FreeCAD, we can model uh, the part we need. Yeah, it looks like this. You can uh, create the part, you measure first, and then you can make the part in this software. And when you've done this, when the uh, modeling is done, you need another program to put the part into the path that the printer can read. For this we need a slicer. Slicer makes one thing, it takes the part we've modeled with FreeCAD and it uh, calculates the path that the printing head must do in the printer. And as you see here, yeah, it's simply a path and a layer over a layer. Yes? You print one layer, then the next layer, and the next layer, and the next layer, and so you have a semi-solid part. You need some other tools, yeah, things to measure, very important, a ruler or a gauge, and you need some to tools uh, to finish the obje object. Uh, there are always uh, some material hanging over and you have to cut it away, say with a sharp knife, or you need some kind of sandpaper or small files or anything like this. I guess every uh, household in Germany has this in his case, in his tool case. So, and how does a printer work? It's very simply, you have this string of plastic and you fill it into uh, a hot tip or top called extruder. The plastic is melted and will be uh, moved over the uh, printed part. The uh, head and the workbench will be moved in the X, Y and Z axis uh, by some um, thread and rods inside of the printer. Uh, you can watch or see it tomorrow in our workshop. The information, how it is printed, uh, will be provided by the slicer you saw even. Yeah. The result is a part that is printed layer by layer. As you can see here, it's not very solid. Yeah. Uh, if it's printed well, it will be compact and it will be all stable, but if it's not well printed, it could happen that one layer uh, loosens and the whole part is uh, simply a piece of plastic. The material fed by the extruder will melt, melt into the layer which exists on the, on the part, so you can, can't get a real uh, uh, solid, solid body. Like if you make normally a plastic part, you have some kind of form, you have some melted uh, plastics and you press it into the form like a snowball and get a solid body. This is what you cannot uh, do with this. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And the layer, the height of a layer is only 0 0.2 millimeters. 0 .2 millimeters. This is not much. Yeah. If uh, the workbench of the printer is not well adjusted, there could something happen like the, the head is too high and he prints and put out the melted filament, but it ends somewhere in the nowhere and you won't have a big string and a big nubble of, of a filament on the workbench, but it is no part. So then process, process. Normally you don't have the original, original part. Yeah, it would be easy if we had it, but we don't have it. So we have to take really measure, measure, and measure. Yeah, we use rulers, gauges, calibers, etc., to get the correct values. 
uh, if it is possible, you should simplify the part. Uh, as you can see, I have always trouble with the cold. Uh, so, if possible, simplify the part. Um, if you want to get a hole close, it's sometimes better to make the part a little bit bigger because you can uh, remove the material that is too much. If you made it too small, you can't add any material. If possible, make it simpler. Yeah? If you uh, get, get too much lost in, in your measuring and say, okay, this hole I want it here and I want it there and I want it there, uh, maybe it won't fit if it's printed because something could went wrong. The parts, when they are printed, they shrink. And so you have a hole set it on the correct side in the 3D model, uh, but if you put it on the laptop, you see, okay, the hole is one millimeter off the position it should be, and uh, so it doesn't help anything. And another thing is don't think to digital. Simply use sketch a piece of paper and a pencil and make a small sketch and there you can see it because we are analog people, analog humans. And uh, sometimes I see people who want to do it all in the computer and always see, okay, uh, it would be better to just to take just this old piece of paper, very analog and very old fashioned. So, so modeling with the free cut. Yeah, I showed this one here before. This is a program we use. Uh, there you can very simply uh, uh, make the model, but you have to learn it. It's a process. Uh, I think you need five to ten hours uh, until you are able to make such a, such a part as here. Uh, if you print small noses like this one here, uh, or a small hole, yeah, uh, they are not as stable as the original. As, as I mentioned before, it is uh, printed layer by layer and it's not as solid. You can print this nose and maybe it's perfect, but it will not, will not hold. So leave this nose, don't print it. Yeah? Don't print it and use some adhesive taper or something else to uh, get the part on the laptop. One other thing is if you get a part you normally uh, that is flat, you want to start from the flat side. What we normally think, okay, we do it from above. But most laptops are curved. This is not flat. So you have to go from the side. You make a sketch from this side and explode it in the depth. So, so make simply this sketch and then you tell the program, the FreeCAD, to make it bigger in the length and not in the height. So if you've done this, you can export the object as an Elias mesh. That's uh, uh, the kind of file we use. The next step is the slicing. <laughs> Sorry. Next step is slicing. A slicing means that you got this object from FreeCAD and uh, the slicing software makes uh, the layers or computes the layers you need it to be printed. You can see it here in this software very well. If we go, it's in some overview. This is a whole object. But if you go here in the preview, you see one slice after the other. You can show it here by using this ruler. And you see uh, there's one layer over the others. And this software only computes the paths you need to move the heads and the workbench in the printer. One important thing is controlling. It's a simple thing. If you uh, do anything wrong and the uh, printing is not well, you have to start it again and it's very time consuming. If you've done all these things and it's okay, you can export it as a G-code file. G-code file is uh, uh, the language which uh, the printers understand. So I can put it on a SD card, put it into the printer, and the printer knows, okay, I have to print this part this, part this way. So, and so you can start printing, but one thing is the emissions of the printer. Uh, think about chemicals that are in the filament. So don't use it in closed rooms. You have to build an exhausting system. We've made here a big cap of plexiglass and we have a hose above here to get the bad air out of this thing. Yeah. It's loud, 
Yeah, you cannot uh, put it in your living room or in, in, in your sleeping room and say, okay, let it run all night. No, it doesn't work. So, so copy the G code of your part to the SD card, take it to your printer and start printing. One thing is it takes hours, hours and hours and hours and hours. I have a part of this size, it will take maybe one up to five hours only to print. So, and you have to control the printer. If anything happens, yeah, yeah, some things always happen. Yeah, is the filament feed it well? Sometimes it's simply broken and there's no filament. The printer is a stupid thing. He doesn't know there's no filament. He still works and works and works and works. Yes, it uh, makes no sense, but he works. Yeah. Sometimes a filament is blocked in the, in the wheel where it's on. You have it on a big wheel and sometimes uh, the layers are so that they are sometimes off block and you can't roll the filament from the block, uh, from, from the wheel. And what the other thing is, is the part printed well so far? Yeah. If anything happened or uh, if sometimes the head uh, takes the printed part with it. And so it's away from the plate. And it's still the same like, like it was uh, before. It's feeding filament to the workbench, but there's no part. So it cannot print. And etc., etc., etc. What I want to say is it's not complicated, it's time consuming. And you have always watch to watch. So when printed, there will always be unnecessary material. Yeah, some some rats of uh, pieces of, of the filament will hang over somewhere, so just take a knife and cut it away. Or use a file. The holes might not be correct in, in, in their widths. You have to take a little drill and open it carefully. And as I say carefully, I mean carefully. Never use something like a, a drill, electrical driller. It will destroy the whole part. If you want, you can smoothen it with some Sandpaper, yeah, oops, uh, sorry. The other thing I mentioned is it's very time consuming, yeah, making the 3D model, slicing it, printing, it could be six to 10 hours, I would say, yeah, depending on uh, the complications you had in the whole process. The other thing is you have to learn, of course, to make a 3D model. Yeah, you don't have to study rocket science. I think, I think if I can do it, nearly everybody else can do it. So, but you have to learn it. And sometimes you need several attempts before you get the right part. Yeah. Very, <coughs> very often things happen, like warping, what means if the part cools down, it will twist in itself, so you cannot use it. Or the broken filament was on the way and some other thing is shrinking. You made a part which is, I say, 10 centimeters, but when you put it on the uh, laptop, there are one or two millimeters missing because it shrinks when it cools down. So the costs, in Germany we have uh, at eBay printers from 100 euro. Uh, it's not too much, I think. Uh, we bought a one which is more expensive because we think this will just give us uh, a bit better, uh, yeah, better, better parts. But you must think of what I said before, it's the exhausting system. If you use PETG, you may can use it at home in the cellar or somewhere else where you don't live normally. Um, <clears throat> but uh, if you use uh, uh, ABS, you have to use an exhausting system. And that means you have to make a closed housing in some way and you have to make some hose and some uh, kind of, of a pump to get the air out of this thing. ABS and PG are around about uh, 15 euros a kilogram. With a one kilogram you can make really a whole lot of parts. It's so, that was it. If anybody has questions, tomorrow there will be a workshop here in this small room. And if anyone has some questions or answers, and maybe tomorrow I can speak again, uh, so come and feel free to ask. <laughs> okay, thank you, Thompson. Uh, you can see the three printer over there. It's uh, in the room next to you, and we can explain or show you everything live. Um, you will also hear now in the next uh, presentation about the tool installation tool.
Um, Frank is going to set up the computer in a few seconds. Ich glaube, jetzt nur im Tiefschlaf geht er noch, den noch. Und das Funkding. Ist das? Nee. It will take a while to get it back from the sleep mode. Um, in the meantime, I would like to explain you about some other installation tools. We did some programming, Javier, from Munich, uh, over there. And uh, can you just raise your hand again? Yeah, that's the one, this guy. Um, he is, um, together with Thompson, he worked on a tool that we call Leptix. It's a complete installation tool. We have upstairs prepared something which you can take with you to Africa or other places but if you want. This is a complete disk drive. So what Frank is showing you, he takes it from a PXE server, from a network server, but you can also take it from an external disk drive. And all the installation software which we are using is also available for free, so you can download it, but here we prepared it to carry it with you. Just an offer. And um, you will also see the equipment over there in the next room. You brought it with you from Switzerland. Thank you. It's your turn. Grüezi miteinander. Grüezi miteinander. That's the Swiss saying of hello. Um, and you can see by the first slide, I'm not alone. I brought Ron with me, who is the hub manager in Zurich. And I'm running the lab organization in Switzerland. Uh, for us, it's already a long day because we started our engines two o'clock in the morning. We came by car, five and a half, six hours. We wanted to be here, thank you. And we also understand, uh, Ron and myself, we are the only ones which are standing behind, beside or in between the lunch break and, and yourself. And we brought some nice Swiss chocolate. Who likes Swiss chocolate? Oop, one for you. Who else? One for you. Oh, okay, and there's more. We have more, but you only get those if you raise some good questions later. So, yeah, wait, 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 wait. So, uh, I think there, for timing reasons, there's no need to introduce ourselves, but I spent the last 40 years in the IT industry uh, in various companies. I'm still working in there. That's how to make my income and my living. Uh, but my full dedication is Labdo, and I started 2012 as a single person, and you can see in one of these pictures, we did grow quickly. Um, the laptop number 472 is the, my personal one, which I donated, one of the first donations in Switzerland, and that picture on the lower left corner shows the first laptop sanitation workshop. And we spent about three, four hours, just three people, two friends and myself, and it took us about five hours to prepare three laptops. Five hours, three laptops, and we struggled all the usual things. It didn't boot, it has passwords, the hard drive didn't work, it did run out of memory, all sorts of issues, and we had to resurrect the machine manually. And with a growing number of laptops, we said something is wrong. We want to become more productive. It can't be that we spend so much time on single laptops. So we did run a test, a contest. We had several groups at the University of Zurich, at the University of Bale, some Linux specialists, and we wanted to find a way how to quickly install laptops on mass volumes, because what we have foreseen, even in 2012, 2013, that we will receive more and more laptop donations. And about 60% of the laptop donations we are getting in Switzerland are coming from private persons, and the remaining is coming from companies. And the number of companies which are supporting us is growing, and we are proud just yesterday afternoon uh, before we came here, we got the go for a large company in Geneva. We're getting 350 laptops on board. 350 laptops, it's a huge number. So 
If we would spend one and one on these computers, we would sit there for ages, and the children, on the other hand, they would wait, because I know there are people in Romania, there are people in other countries, they're waiting for these laptops. So how we are doing this at the moment, our solution is the so-called PXE, which stands for Pre-Boot Execution Environment, which means it's a server, and a server is not a huge machine, it's just a strong laptop itself, it has a switch, it has cables, and simultaneously you can clone the classical image Ralph has mentioned earlier. You can close these at the same time. And during a workshop we are running these days, we have the possibilities to have six servers in one room. You can see it here in the pictures. And six times four, in one second we duplicate or we clone 24 laptops, which means we can achieve during a whole day, which typically lasts eight or ten hours, a lot. A lot of laptops, and it's becoming our hobby to do this, to do more. And it's not only the technicalities, which we can show later. Tomorrow we are here, we show you the server, we brought server, we bought equipment. It's easy. It's easy to replicate, everybody can do this, it's all pre-configured, so an easy thing to do. It creates a lot of fun, but the important thing is if you have so many computers in one day, you also need to take care for the logistics during that workshop, and you need to have sufficient number of helpers and a lot of fun. And this is what Ron and myself are explaining how we do this, because we split the work up into various workstations. And you can see typically a workshop has between 10 and 20 participants. So some people are cleaning laptops, some are doing the technical cloning, some are tagging the information and entering in, into our portal. And last but not least, we always have a repair team as well. So, and that all needs to be prepared and coordinated. And Ron will explain later how we do this. The second thing, getting tired? Somebody was asking for chocolate in the background. Ooh! Got what? Yes. The, particip the participants which help us are often newcomers. They have never heard about Lab2, but they are excited because they see in social media what they're doing, they want to help. So we have newcomers. We have people who did come a couple of times, and we have people like Ron and myself who do it every day. So we say, to make it fun and easy to understand, we say our workshop is a country. Labdu is a country, and if you come the first time, you are a tourist. You don't have a clue, you have an idea what might happen, which, which cities you want to visit, etc., etc. And they, they get these... Uh, name badges, and they, they see by color, oh, that's a tourist, that's a tourist. So we guide these tourists. And the next level are the people who come more often. They come two times, three times, four times, and they become a traveler. So if a tourist has returned three or four times, he has worked on various workstations, we promote them to a traveler. And then the ones who want to really work every time with us, they become guides. At the moment, we live in that country, Labdu, so Ron and myself, we are the guides, the rest are travelers and tourists. That's one thing which helps us a lot. And the second big thing, and you can see by the numbers, even laptops are coming by containers, um, we make a gamification out of that workshop. We make a lot of fun. When we start a workshop, nobody has a clue how many laptops we will sanitize during that day. And we ask the person, what do you guess? What's your guess? How many will you do? And we explain them. We have done 20 in the past. We have done 50 in the past. We have done even more. And people get excited. They discuss how can we do. There's a lot of spirit, a lot of fun, a lot of excitement. And then at the end of the workshop, we explain, oh, we have done a huge number. And the person who comes closest, guess what? Chocolate could be an option, <laughs> but we also have cheese. We have bank accounts. Yeah, normally it's a bottle of wine or champagne and there's a big hoo-ha when it, when it happens. And you can see by these numbers, we were growing. So in April 20, uh, 2016, we achieved six minutes per laptop, which was not enough for us. Uh, November 2016, we hit 100 laptops in a day. 
And just last year, we had over 200 laptops with 14 helpers in one day, just by preparation, everything. And uh, thank you, thank you. It's a team effort. It's a team effort. It takes a lot of uh, preparation. And I guess for 2019, we have some exciting plans. We're looking for more, for bigger numbers in a day. So I hand over to Ron. Ron will explain and guide you through that process. How do we set up a workshop? How does it work? And how will come everything together? Ron. Thank you, Frank. Thank you. Also from my side, grüezi miteinander, grüezi, welcome, bienvenido aquí. Hablo un poquito español también. So, Frank told you before that we all are coming out of Lebdu land, and uh, you can see a couple of stations of my uh, personal education. I come a little bit of the airline industry. I have also skills from IT, so I have a kind of a difference backpack in my in my backpack so so anyway just to, to let you know we Frank and me we have also a lot of fun doing what we're doing we're always we're always very excited and we are looking forward for our next sanitation workshop that's going to be on the 8th of uh, December and we already have uh, 20 participants which are um, looking forward to join us and we would have we would actually have more but we had to uh, put um, uh, a limit to this because uh, Otherwise, you wouldn't have enough work for every, for every person. So that's, pardon? That's also something, exactly. So how do we do it? We have workstations. We have uh, five workstations. We have a cleaning workstation. We have, um, um, we have a cleaning workstation. We have a, a repair workstation. We have a, a shred workstation, and we have a tacking workstation, and of course, um, uh, all that together. Um, yeah, so we have all these, um, all these workstations together, and we, we have to divide all the people that come to us. They, uh, they, we like to uh, put them to stations where they have like, uh, certain skills and where they have fun. Some people don't want to be on the technical uh, stations. They like to be you know, like cleaning, because they feel like cleaning is better for them. And other people have like administration skills, so they like, they, they like, to, they like to do the, t the tagging. So this is basically how we, we set it up. What we cannot do on a working station is shredding, because uh, shredding takes quite a while for every machine. So we have to do that beforehand. So all machines are already shred. For those people who don't know what a shred is, that means a secure, uh, the leading of the data on the hard drive. So here, this is, a, this is our setup. Uh, we have uh, workstation one, that's the cleaning. Um, there's a start, we have all the devices ready uh, to start. Uh, that's actually my job. I prepare all the, the laptops, I get them out of the cellar. And uh, sometimes we have some really heavy tasks. I always have to watch out for my back. Frank sometimes helps me also. And uh, we uh, take care of all these laptops and make sure that they are ready when the people show up. And um, we like to give a kind of a event spirit. So it's really fun and people really want to come and join us. So workstation one is cleaning. And after the devices are cleaned, they go on to the next station. And uh, workstation four is the PXE server stations. We have four PXE servers. We can also extend it to B6. We had to do that last time because uh, we had so many participants that we said, oh, well, so let's introduce two more servers and let's see where that brings us to. So uh, we did that and um, um, it was a, a little bit of a problem with our tagging crew. Workstation five is uh, tagging. It's entering all the data into our system. And of course, uh, uh, they were like, um, what are we going to do? We have too many, we have, we're, we're, not, we're not following up with, uh, with the, um, uh, we have too many, too many laptops, so uh, we have to hurry up. So we ad adapted a little bit and we uh, made sure that, that there were more people working on the tagging uh, station. And uh, so we are like very flexible on 
on the task. Workstation one, this is actually a, st a screenshot that we, um, that we show during, the, during the, uh, um, our uh, briefing, our pre-briefing. We have a briefing and before we start and a, and a debriefing at the end of the, of the uh, workshop. That's our process slip. We have all the data on the, of, the, um, of the device on a process slip, which actually we gather all the information before uh, they end up being uh, at the workstation five where we enter all the data into the system. Workstation four, we initiate the PXE process as Frank mentioned before, and um, we add all technical informations to the process slip. We also have a final inspection. That's actually the selections of uh, the images that we have. We even go back to 14.4. This is a, a Linux version that comes out of 2014. We have so many very old machines, which uh, out of resource reasons, we, we install 14.4. Then we have a nice script that shows us all the information of the device. Very nice, lovely. We can just read the screen and write it down on our process slip. Then we enter all the information as mentioned on the process slip. Of course, we also have a quality assurance. We don't want any device that goes on this long trip to Africa or wherever and then ends up uh, not working. So we do on every device, we do a quality assurance. We check the keyboard language. We check the wireless LAN connectivity. We check browser functionality and we also test the file, uh, the, the sound, uh, the audio, the audio, um, Drive, thanks. So workstation five, of course, um, all the tagging has to be done, uh, all the information has to be entered into the system, and of course that's a, a, a very, uh, I say, a task. Remember, if you do that all day, sometimes uh, some mistakes could show up. We're actually working on an automation process which will um, eventually um, make bring us into a situation where we don't have to enter the data into the system anymore. Uh, Jordi and we are working on that. Thanks Jordi, by the way, for your very appreciated uh, support on this. We call this uh, the next step, LabDo 4.0. Then of course the uh, device gets a status, uh, a number and a status S2 is ready for the mission. Here you can see uh, an, um, our um, handling of the, the power adapter and of course um, we all at the end of, a, of a, a workshop we get together and we make some pictures and and we celebrate the day and of course uh, it's always uh, a lot of fun and that's why we are always uh, overwhelmed of all these people that want to come up for the next time and uh, it's always uh, a lot of fun here uh, a lovely picture from South Africa, Frank, you'd like to make a comment to this? Um, yeah, that is one of the Edo villages in uh, Johannesburg, a very poor region. Children normally do not have a chance and we are very proud of being able to, uh, being able to deliver quite a nice portion of laptops on a regular basis, which is, uh, which is required that we have the appropriate setup. You saw this little picture beforehand with the power supply and the cabling. If you imagine, if you have three, four laptops, it's not a problem with the cables. If you have 200 laptops, imagine the number of cables just for these laptops. It's such a box, such a box. So we instruct our team to really put it up with a rubber band. Otherwise, you, you get a huge mess. And it's, it's not nice if you send it to these people, to these children and they have to unpack it. So, and there's a lot of tiny detail which we need to take care of bef before each workshop that everything runs very smoothly. So we'll show you tomorrow at, uh, at the workshop. Any questions? I've heard good questions, get a chocolate. Oh, there's one in the back. Oh. Javier. No question, no, no, no. Bring it back, bring it back. <laughs> Thank you. 
So my first question is how do your fellow uh, window, uh, Microsoft certified colleagues uh, feel about you installing uh, Linux is on top of their, operat of their beloved operating system? Or well, um, that's a good question, Javier. <laughs> anyway, uh, you know, uh, I find the idea of LabDo a fantastic one. I'm um, very uh, uh, excited always to uh, um, engage myself for this project. I think it's uh, very valuable, especially for all these children that can profit from this. So, um, uh, how you say, um, I step over my shadow and I say, well, uh, not a problem for me. I, uh, I have a big potential of learning a new field. And uh, in the last uh, three and a half years, I've been learning a lot in Linux. And it's great. It's good. Good stuff. Uh, now the real question. Uh, I get another second. Uh, uh, have you thought that is it possible to extend this uh, PXE uh, installation for out of the, in the internet uh, clients? So I assume you are working in an internal network in the place where you are doing the Pixie installation. Is it possible to somehow connect a client server? So I, from my home, uh, use uh, your Pixie server, so I don't really need to know anything because I just connect my laptop, I just execute one command, and my laptop will connect to your, to your okay, PXE it's, server. It's another very good question. We've thought about it. Technically, it's possible. The challenge is the speed over the internet because we are putting about 12 to 16 gigabytes of data and even if, if, if it goes via network, cable network, it still takes too much time and depends on the, the internet rates you have to pay for. For us it doesn't make sense, but it could be an option, let's say, in country or in city if you're sitting close to the machine, then yes. Uh, Tavi, you, you know uh, about the data we are handling, the terabyte. I, he I heard that the counselor, uh, yeah. your friend, your, the counselor is, is saying that we are going to have real uh, fast internet uh, soon in Germany. So yeah. that and that is, that is the reason <laughs> why you have to get a lot of data through uh, line. doesn't matter if it's in Europe or America. It's more or less impossible to have all these data uh, very fast at home. So that's why we... Yeah, if, 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 you, if you use R-Sync and other mechanism in, in the background, you can sync with our FTP server, of course. But in technical uh, countries like Europe or America or um, Japan, it's possible. But I don't think it's, it's uh, possible in, feasible in, in, in all countries. Uh, besides that, I want to congratulate you for your concept. Yeah, and two this more questions. Ah, two more questions. Okay. <laughs> Not only for the chocolate things. Um, Congratulations for your concept to make it like a gamification and a happening if you come together so the workers distribute you in different heads. In Germany, I see different uh, um, people thinking about our environment, not to buy everything new, so they are coming repair cafes. I see at every corner here in Germany, so I think a good strategic aspect, lab do, and together in different countries with repair cafes must be a good uh, solution. Maybe the idea is not new. Thanks for this suggestion. You're right. And we're having even team members on board which come from a repair cafe. So the repair cafe guys in Zurich are so excited about a the project, they come every time. And they're also a drop-off point. So people, uh, regular users who want to drop off a laptop can go to a repair cafe and they, uh, they collect it for us. It's the same here in Germany. Um, repair cafe, you can bring in your hair dryer and your laptop, so it's a wide variety of, of items. Uh, help us from lab do join repair cafe and the other way around. Um, besides that, there is an interesting initiative uh, from F uh, MIT, Fab Lab. Uh, one here from Hochschule Rhein-Ruhr, yeah, M Mrs. Friese. She's joining today. And um, nearly every university has a fab lab. It's like a repair cafe on higher technology level. And we are also initi initiating co cooperative uh, projects with them. So I think there's a lot of uh, initiatives which could join LabDo and LabDo can join projects. If this is not a question. For timing reasons and lunch, last question. Good question. 
at the moment, and typically, we have more laptops than people we can handle. So we have a luxury, we have a seller, and there are about four, five hundred laptops waiting at the moment. And because, like all of you, we are volunteers, so it takes us time every workshop to prepare, to perform, etc. So at the moment, we do two things. Every quarter, we do an open workshop. Every person can come. Really, and really, every person comes from even children, 12 year olds, they all want to help, they're all excited. One. And the second is we offer to companies a so called corporate social responsibility workshop. So a company might say, wow, I want to help, I want to support. Frank, you get 15 people from us, volunteer, we come, and this is what we do uh, one by one. So we decide when this happens, when we have companies who want to do this. And for us, it's the perfect solution. So you have a regular one, and in between you have certain ones. So uh, I would say on average, we have uh, six to eight per year. Uh, you mean for a public or for, for an open workshop? For us, it's about two, three weeks because we are ready to go. We have all the paperwork, we have the idea. It's a matter of, for us to find the time to prepare it, go into the cellar, take all the stuff, etc., split it to the workstations. But typically it's two, three weeks at the moment. So we can, if a company would come, we quickly could say, yeah, we do it in the next two weeks. Thank you. Thank you for your attention. See you later. Just one or two sentences. Um, this is a way how you can install a lot of computers and having very few time. Both are working, they have very few free time. Uh, it's a mass production. We in Germany work a little bit different. We have specific uh, English, French, Spanish um, images which we clone or Swahili, English and other combinations. So we are a little bit more individual. It takes more time. And we are a distributed, we have a distributed concept. So, like Ali in Munich and others, they have uh, time, invest time to make a few laptops per day or per weekend. Uh, so, it depends on your uh, living situation, about your time. Uh, this is just an offer. There are other concepts, and you have to decide which is the best uh, for you. So, about lunch, um, we have now one hour break. Uh, it is everything prepared upstairs in the cafeteria. Um, drinks are free here, down uh, on the conference area. You can, there's great coffee and great drinks upstairs, but you have to pay for that extra. Um, there's a small change for tomorrow. We plan to also offer you a vegan uh, meal tomorrow, but um, there, there was a change in the cook is not available tomorrow. So we will keep some meal from today for those people who need vegan uh, meals for tomorrow. For all the others, I hope it's okay when we order some pizza. Uh, it's, um, it's not very high level food, but um, I think we, we can manage that. I will ask tomorrow what kind of pizza and about uh, margarita and salami and whatever, and then we can, uh, can organize that for tomorrow, just to inform you that Today it's vegan, tomorrow there will be vegan for those needing it, and the rest will be uh, pizza. Okay, see you back in one hour. Thank you.
Das ist noch drei Stücke. Dieses habe ich noch. Also noch. Ja, der ist auf 20 Prozent runter. Genau. Das heißt, dann habe ich. So, ich habe für hier zwei frische Batterien gelegen. Ja. Und die muss ich kaufen oder soll man wechseln? Ja, wir können, wir müssen nur nachher damit rechnen, dass er dann äh, weggeht. Dann, dann würde ich sagen, dann wechseln wir gleich einfach. Ja. hat oder so kann man ja alles draufpacken, ja, aber das, äh, was ich gut, beim Macintosh würde ich einfach den als Firewire Target äh, konfigurieren und dann kann ich jeden Mac drüber bügeln mit was immer ich will. Und dann, äh, aber bei Windows hast du ja so unterschiedliche Hardware-Konfigurationen. Bei, bei ja, geht es trotzdem genau die, die Hardware, ne? ist ja, ja so unterschiedlich. Aber trotzdem also kannst du musst ja für alle möglichen Eventualitäten einen Treiber ja, drauf haben. Deshalb nehmen wir diese Ubuntu, weil das erkennt ja. beim Hochfahren, was brauche ich und konfiguriert sich zu ja. 99 sehr gut. Ist das äh, noch an dem, dass das Ubuntu äh, auch Daten sammelt? Das war für mich damals ist, so ein Punkt. Ist immer noch, deshalb wir nehmen das Ubuntu, das ist ja sparsamer, das macht da ah, nichts. Okay. Das Ubuntu ist, ist nicht, nicht so mein Ding, also mir gefällt das auch nicht mit der, dieser Datenpolicy, was die da haben. Ja. Da hätte ich sonst gesagt, also da muss man irgendwie weiß nicht, einen Blocker reinsetzen, der das unterbindet. Ja, ja. Ja, das war so mein Punkt. Nee, wir Ansonsten, ich halte sehr viel von Debian. Ja. Ähm, hast du, hast du
Sebastian war ja richtig, ne? Der Daniel, Entschuldigung, weil je nach, nach einem halben Tag kriege ich das mit den Namen nicht mehr. Sieh's mir nach. Okay, before we uh, go into the presentation of AFB, here is Daniel from uh, Hub Rostock and he is over there on the, on the right side with a laptop and you can connect your mobile phones with a laptop to get more access to educational content. So part of LabDo is also that each laptop can act as a server. And if you are in a class you uh, and your pupils have um, tablets or mobile phones, you can spread the uh, content of a laptop to any mobile device. That is also an option which you have in a school. And Daniel is showing this live over there today and as well uh, tomorrow in details if you want. So this is just another uh, proof that LabDo is a very flexible concept. And we worked it out in a few hours, so days. <laughs> so, But it's, a, it's an interesting option for uh, countries where you have uh, mobile phones but not so many laptops, then you only need one laptop and you can spread it to a number of devices. And also one other background idea was that um, we might be in a situation where we do not have continuous power supply. So if we have continuous power supply, we can use a router and connect it to the laptop. But if we don't have it, we can use the laptop directly as the router, as access point so that tablets and smartphones can connect directly to it. And yeah, this was the idea. Okay. Thank you. But now the promised uh, presentation of Daniel Büchle. He came from the south of Germany and he will leave uh, after the, shortly after the presentation because he has some private uh, arrangements today. But I'm very grateful that you came the long way for just for a few hours. Thank you.
Yes, uh, thank you, Ralph. Hello to everybody. Uh, thanks for being here. It's a great pleasure uh, to present our uh, the company for which I work for and uh, the partnership uh, with Lepto. I met uh, Ralph several years ago, I don't know, five or ten years, and uh, we built up a very good partnership and uh, what's up with this partnership and uh, what uh, the company I work for is doing, I will present you in the next uh, 15 to 20 minutes. Um, so, I work for AFB. AFB, the English translation, translation is uh, work for people with uh, disabilities. And uh, we are Europe's largest non-profit uh, IT company. Um, non-profit uh, because we have about uh, five to 45 percent uh, people with disabilities uh, which uh, work in every branch and do uh, most of the business uh, our company uh, does. We are an IT refurbisher. Um, I don't have to tell you what, uh, what IT refurbishing is. Uh, many of you do it every day with notebooks uh, mostly. We also do it with, with uh, printers, with screens, uh, with mobile phones and so on. Means uh, old uh, hardware which is no longer used uh, on, uh, at big uh, companies. Uh, um, uh, clean, repair, um, uh, create up uh, and uh, sell it or spend it uh, and uh, give a second life uh, to the IT hardware. We are a business partner for, for the companies. Um, many companies uh, change the IT hardware every three, four, five years and need uh, important services like uh, logistic services, like data destruction uh, and uh, reporting of the serial numbers and uh, so on. So we are an important uh, partner for, the, for uh, large and, and small companies who change the hardware. We are an inc inclusion enterprise um, because of uh, the people with uh, disabilities uh, we have and of course because of the reuse of the hardware we are a uh, kind of uh, environmental expert company. So our uh, main business is refurbish and uh, resell uh, used hardware. In a, in a very good quality uh, means mostly business hardware from Lenovo, from Dell, from HP and, and Fujitsu um, uh, to an attractive price uh, mostly to, to end customers uh, and non-profit organizations uh, and uh, so give the hardware a second life uh, with uh, ecological and social uh, added value. You can see the, the process uh, here. Uh, we collect the hardware. Um, we have a uh, uh, known uh, fleet, uh, own trucks who drive through Germany but also through other countries, collect the hardware um, with uh, special uh, boxes, uh, for example. Uh, we uh, make the uh, kind of reporting, we check the manufacturer, the uh, inventory number, the serial number and so on. Uh, we make a test of the hardware, the data, destruction uh, with a software or with a shredder. Um, we repair, we clean, um, but there's also dismantlement uh, um, with uh, older hardware or hardware which we uh, can't repair so that uh, these parts can go to uh, recycling uh, in Europe. We sell the hardware with uh, an online shop in, in four countries, uh, with uh, local stores where people can buy them, um, but also on Amazon, on eBay, and uh, all the platforms uh, are, uh, which are ex existing. <laughs> the Partners we have from where we get the, the hardware, uh, large companies, for example, like Siemens or ThyssenKrupp, um, they want to have a very good service. Uh, data security is, is uh, very important for them, and uh, we can offer this with, with own drugs, uh, with a very secure IT collection, with a goods receipt, uh, with a certified data erasure. Um, we use the software Blanco. 
uh, which has uh, worldwide the most certifications uh, in data erasure. We have uh, in every branch a uh, hard disk shredder, um, so we can do everything in this process by our own and don't need any subcontractors uh, for these uh, services, which is uh, very important to our uh, partners. Uh, moreover, we offer some benefits for the employers of our partners and we offer to them a kind of sustainability reporting um, which means they, they get an annual certificate of us uh, which shows to them how many um, people with disabilities we uh, could employ with the hardware, uh, through the hardware we get and moreover about uh, CO2 and uh, energy uh, we could save by using the IT hardware uh, two or three more years. Here for example you see on the right side, sorry that it's in German, uh, the certificate um, we offer to them and mostly it we uh, handle it over to the CEO, so it's, it's a high level uh, topic uh, for the companies and uh, every CEO likes to have a big certificate in his room and uh, so that he sh can show his uh, uh, engagement uh, to everyone. It's a very important uh, tool of uh, communication we do with, uh, with our partners. Moreover, the um, employees of the partner, they can buy the hardware to reduce prices uh, in our online shop or at a kind of uh, uh, selling a mobile shop in the, in the company, um, in the rooms of our partners directly. And for example here also you can see the special uh, notebook uh, boxes uh, um, which we offer. You can put nine notebooks into one uh, box, you can close it uh, and it's an uh, important uh, topic for our partners because of uh, dangerous goods, uh, the batteries which are inside and uh, the transporting laws here in uh, Germany and in the European Union. So here you can see where we are located, uh, actually in uh, four countries in uh, Europe. Uh, we started in Germany, um, France is growing very fast. Um, Next year perhaps we go uh, to Slovakia and uh, in addition to this we, uh, we drive to many neighbor countries, uh, for example Benelux or Poland or Italy um, with the trucks uh, from the next uh, AFB location to collect the hardware. So I already told uh, why we are a non-profit and why we are an inclusion enterprise. Um, we try to create 500 jobs for people uh, with disabilities, 500 jobs with, uh, in, in the IT business. Um, that's uh, the whole aim of our, of our doing. And uh, so almost every second uh, place uh, employee in our company, um, uh, uh, people with uh, disability works. And it's also the, the concept which our partners like. Uh, data erasure, data destruction, certified processes are very important for them. But also this is the social added value we can deliver to them and which they can communicate in, uh, uh, in their uh, CSR report, for example. So and of course, we are, uh, it's important thing for us to make uh, the life of IT hardware as long as possible. Um, many uh, companies need to change their hardware after three till, till five years, but uh, many private persons uh, can use hardware for, for 10 years or even longer um, uh, in the, for example, for with office, with internet, so you don't need a new uh, notebook or a new PC and uh, that's we, why we put many money in, in marketing uh, around our stores and try to give this message uh, to the customers, uh, to the citizens to say, hey, um, please buy a used notebook, buy a used printer before you buy a new one that you really don't need. 
So here you can see about uh, some facts about our company, um, some I already told. Um, at the moment we are not 320, almost 370 uh, employees, so we are really uh, fast uh, growing uh, during the, uh, between the, the four countries we are. And uh, you also can see that we have, uh, that we can 65% uh, of the hardware we get uh, goes to remarketing, not to recycling, um, which is very good because we also get uh, uh, hardware which is uh, 10 years uh, or older uh, sometimes. And then it's uh, really very hard uh, to make a remarketing. So you can hear some partners of uh, of us and you can see this is a service uh, for really big companies uh, which are worldwide located or located in, in, in many countries. Um, that's, uh, and the advantage is you get really a high number of, of uh, PCs uh, and uh, notebooks and printers. I think in 2018 we will reach about 400,000 uh, IT devices uh, um, which is which you can on only reach with uh, partnerships with uh, big companies. So and now to the cooperation with uh, with Lepto. Um, I'm really a fan of Lepto. I like the work uh, Ralph and you all do every day, every week. It's really fantastic. Um, I love it very much. I would spend all the laptops uh, which we get to laptop, but we have to pay uh, 400 persons <laughs> at our business, so we can't spend uh, every laptop. Um, but we can help Lepto, and we uh, did uh, help Lepto in the, in the past, and also Lepto helped us to grow. That's very, uh, very interesting. And mostly it's because of the process, the logistics, uh, and the uh, data destruction. And, uh, at the moment, they are looking more and more on this topic. Uh, they want secured, certified processes, and that's where we can help. So, uh, Ralph uh, often calls me or sends an email and says, okay, here's a possible partner to a large company um, who wants to, to do donate the laptops to Lepto, um, but they want a certified data erasure. And that's where we can help. That's where our trucks can drive to the locations of the, or to the big companies, um, collect the hardware, offer good services, make the data destruction at our branches, send the uh, uh, destruction uh, reports, the serial numbers and so on from every device to the company and then um, spend the laptops uh, to let do. We also can take, um, that's also an advantage, every kind of, of IT device. So perhaps Lepto only wants to have uh, notebooks but uh, a company wants to handle this one company who takes every used hardware, um, also uh, mobile phones, uh, routers and so on, um, which uh, are not so um, important for, for Lepto. So that's where we can help each other. IT collection, data erasure, also spare parts. Uh, uh, we, when we can help with some spare parts for, for notebooks, uh, uh, in former times. Ralph often was in our branches and went through the stock and looked, uh, that's some, there's something I can, I can use and there's something I can use. Um, so we try to help with uh, spare parts. Uh, together we, real, we realized uh, more than a uh, thousand IT donations. Uh, uh, for example, also our, I think about 18 or 19 stores in Europe, um, they are a kind of lab do hub where citizens can come to us and uh, offer and, and give us the notebook from and say, okay, it's for Lepto, and we uh, take it, and uh, we also make a data erasure if the citizen, if the person wants to do it, but the main thing is that we transport it uh, to Lepto and give it to Ralph or to other hubs, um, so um, that we have uh, more and more towns where the people have a local uh, hub um, to give the, give, the, give the notebooks. So when we work together um, in this constellation with Lepto, with AFB and a uh, possible new partner, um, <coughs> of 
course, we have to discuss about the uh, monetary thing um, because uh, AFB, I told it, can't do everything uh, for free. Um, we have about 19 locations. We have about uh, three or 400 employees which we have to pay. Um, but the good thing is that we don't uh, need money to grow. We only need hardware. And uh, so there are two possibilities to work together. One possibility is uh, a company wants to spend every notebook to let do. So, but needs a service, data ratio, logistics, and so on. Um, the only chance to work together is um, we make the services and uh, the company has to uh, come up for the cost. So the company pays us for the services. We have to discuss what's about the uh, hard disk, perhaps, which we can't, uh, <coughs> which we can't delete uh, close to a German standard, but that, that's not a big problem. So most, uh, the, the biggest problem is most companies want a very good service, want to spend everything, but they don't want to pay for it. <laughs> so, um, and that's why the second option um, mostly works better, that we say, okay, you can spend to Lepto, you can, give a great, you can get a great service from AFB, but the deal is that AFB gets some of the notebooks which we sell, so we earn money and we can cover the costs of all the notebooks, of all the, the, the service for all notebooks. So, and almost every partner which we uh, want to get uh, chose this uh, option um, because it's the it's the best for for everyone. So the uh, the company gets the service uh, for free. And uh, if you ask me now, how high is the percentage? Is it 20 or 80 percent, which Lepto or AFB gets? I can't tell you because um, it depends on the quality of the hardware. If someone um, gives us uh, 200 notebooks which are three years old. I think AFB only needs 10 or 20 percent to cover the costs of uh, all the service. So Lepto gets m m very much uh, notebooks. If uh, the notebooks are six or seven years old, uh, so later we can sell the notebooks instead of 400 euro, 400 euro, euro so we need much more laptops to cover the cost. So perhaps uh, it's at uh, 60 or 70 percent. It really depends on the, on the quality. But it works very good. We won uh, two uh, very big partners this year together um, with this uh, model. And so it's, uh, in my opinion, uh, the very best uh, to work together. So I'm also already at the end. Um, if you have any questions uh, to me, please. <laughs> I hope soon. <laughs> uh, I like Spain very much. <laughs> um, we sometimes drive from our location in France uh, to, to Spain to collect some hardware. Um, so I hope in the next years. It mostly depends on the, on the partnerships we have in one country. Um, because in, uh, it's, a kind of, it's a little risk for people with disabilities to go to a, a kind of social business company. Um, so we have to look that there is not a, a partner who only give us hardware for one time. So we need uh, contracts about several years um, before we build up a branch um, with uh, much cost we, we have there. Um, but we have one or two partners in Spain which we uh, deliver from France. Uh, when we can increase the number of partners in Spain, we will uh, build up a branch there. Extend to Africa, yes, very interesting. Um, not at the moment, um, because uh, at the moment we have too much, we growed too fast in Europe, 
we have much stress at the moment to, to make the services really as good as we want. And uh, every uh, other country, every other continent, uh, I think at the moment it would be too early for us. But we cooperate with the GIZ. Is it correct? GIZ. <laughs> um, for example, um, a friend of mine, a colleague of mine, two weeks ago he was in Rwanda um, because Rwanda has built up a big recycling center and all computers from the government has to go to this recycling center but now they had the idea of uh, um, uh, make, uh, making more refurbishment, first refurbishment then recycling and so they asked uh, for our expertise um, to teach them. To, uh, that they come, can come here or that we go to them and uh, they can see our processes uh, and so on, how we do the refurbishment, the software and so on, the partnerships, the communication. Um, so we are of course willing uh, to give this know-how to every country of the, of the world, um, but at the moment not to uh, um, create an, an own branch there. So we would like if, if uh, more countries in, in Africa, wherever, would build up such uh, businesses, such a company, um, and we would support them, but we can't uh, really do it by our own at the moment. <laughs> okay, we are very uh, grateful to have such a strong partner with AFB, and uh, there Again, some very large projects upcoming during the next months. Uh, there are companies uh, like maybe you know with Heidelberg Cement or F3 or others they are donating via uh, the resources of, of AFB because they need uh, the compliance conform uh, data removal from their from their systems. Okay, I think this picture is uh, remembering for, uh, for your travel to Duisburg. Thank you very much. <laughs> I hope uh, you can stay with us for a short while. I don't know when you have to leave. A few minutes, perhaps. Okay, uh, very <laughs> sorry. <to> hear that. <laughs> so if you have some questions, bilateral, you should uh, use the next seconds, then <laughs> you have to leave. Yes, if not, we have some uh, flyers here, there on the table, and I will also put some business cards uh, there, and don't hesitate to contact me also after this uh, event, <laughs> please. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs>
So I think a lot of you know a refugee. Okay, thank you. So you and you and you and you, anybody has to care for refugees. In other case, integration is not possible. This is a very, very big challenge. So why do we care about refugees? In our refugee shelter, we have refugees from 80 nations. Any one of this refugee has a different destiny. They have an escape that was very difficult. They have family members that were murdered. They were enslaved and there is war. There are many, many reasons that refugees come to Europe. Um, a good integration of the refugees is very important for a good living together. And it is very important that the refugees are enabled to earn their own money because this is the only way to put the burden on the society away, to avoid the burden on the society. They should earn their own money. So, and there is another reason, of course, if you have a heater, no, it's winter and you need the heater in your house, but if your heater need maintenance, it's not possible to get skilled workers to do the maintenance. You have to wait for weeks or months. So we really need skilled workers in Germany. And one of the uh, most important things why I am encouraged in caring about refugees is that I imagine my kid would be in a foreign country, confronted with foreign language and foreign culture. I would be happy if there was someone who would care for these kids. So this is the refugee shelter Kapellenstraße in Oberhausen. This picture was made from one re refugee. We have there th 33 rooms. We have a common area, a kindergarten and a social office. This house is not outside of the city. It's integrated in the village and it's made from stone and you can, can't recognize it as a refugee home. We made many projects, Angelika and me, we initiated these projects. Um, I want only pick out one, the swimming course, you see here. The swimming course is an example for one important project. Many of the refugees come, came over the sea and many of the refugees um, were very anxious about their life and their life was um, in some times uh, they could lose their lives. So uh, they, they are very anxious about water and in, with our project we, we took the anxious of the water away. They, we made a swim course, they learn swim, many of them can't swim. We took, a, we took a swim course, they learned swim, and um, so they had a good feeling and what was very, very helpful for the development of the refugees. So my first computer course I made in 2016. Then I brought my computers from home to one computer room and a room and make a computer course. And Angelica and me had a dream. We had the dream that refugees in Germany would be able to get information when they want. We have a dream that the UMAs, in German the word is unbegleiteter minderjähriger Asylsuchender, uncompined minor asylum seekers that are teenagers and kids that uh, are here without parents. Many parents send their kid alone with a neighbor or some or a friend to Europe. They are here without uh, parents and that's the reason why I say we have to care for the refugees. Okay, and we have, we have the dream that we could support them very well. Then um, the refugees in my IT courses could work with the equipment in the course but not at home because they have no equipment. So I have a dream that anybody that visit my IT courses can work at home 
more. And we have a dream that any room in the refugee shelter, there are 33 rooms, have an own computer to use for getting information about the city, about jobs and about other things. And we have the dream that the refugee children can use a computer as well as German children for learning and playing. So, and then the time comes when our dreams come true. I met Ralf in 2016 on the Open Rhine Ruhr. This is a ferry f a trade fair for uh, open source software. And we were very happy because Let Do um, supports our projects. So first, we have to, to fetch all these uh, computers from donations. Um, this is at Krefeld, it's a city 50 kilometers from here where we get 80 old computers. These are double uh, dual, dual core uh, computers. We have to put it in a van. And any of this computer weighs 10 kilograms. So we had 80 computers and equipment more. And you believe me, after that day I was very tired. To handle these computers, it's very exhausting. So then, uh, in the same city, Krefeld, we got a donation from Canon, um, who gave uh, us nearly 80 screens. All the screens has to be prepared, and that is very important. If you get a donation of screen, protect the screen, protect it with a cardboard, like we did it. Use a cardboard and uh, um, a rubber ring to protect it. Sometimes we get donations of computing screens and they are uh, not protected and on the transportation the screen were damaged. So these are some pictures about the screens. And this is Ralph's warehouse where we store all the monitors we give and you see all the monitors are protected. So, but we um, not only get uh, screens and computers, we get cables and mice and keyboards and you don't get it like this. This is sorted and that is sorted too. You get it on a, in a big, big box and everything is in it. It ta takes hours to sort it. Okay. And here we got some computers from Cologne. Okay, this is a picture I started with. And nearly three weeks later, we had an official handover in the refugee shelter. This is my IT team from 2016. And with this team, I installed this computer and prepared it to give it away to other refugees. We had three projects. The first project is every room in the refugee shelter should get his own computer. The second project is that we support um, the un un unaccompanied minors, the UMAs, unbegleitete minderjährige Asylsuchende. They live in shelters specially for teenagers and they and anybody of them should get his own computer in Oberhausen from the Let Do project. And the third project were families in private apartments. They have kids and the kids should be able to work with computers too. It's a big difference if you have uh, Let Do computers in a computer class in a school, then all of the computers are in the same room. If you have it like us, we have 90 computers outside and we have to support it and they are not on, on one place. It's a lot of work to maintain these computers and handle these computers and administrate the computers. So here we see um, how we installed and registered the computers, prepare it for uh, bringing out. Um, we are in Germany and in Germany we must be very, well, we are very exact 
and we have w for everything we have a form sheet and here you see a form sheet this is Antrag someone applied to get a lab two computer so this is uh, the uh, PC room in 2016 there are only a few computer and this is the PC room now we have very good computers from lab two and have a big monitor to make a presentation and IT training. So when we started the IT courses, we, we had nearly 45 interested refugees, but we have only 10, plus, uh, 10 seats in class. When I started with my work, I thought the hardware is the problem, the resor hardware resources, but the hardware is not the problem. Um, Ralph has enough contacts and can, can uh, bring many computers and notebooks, but there are not enough people to, um, to work as teacher. So, world, if you have interest, call me and you can help us. Okay. Um, we want and engineers they have very good IT level but we have farmers too they never in their life hold a mouse in their hand so we have to do courses with people that fit together who fit together um, one advantage was that the refugees from 2016 from our IT courses had good German skills now. So we could uh, put people in the IT courses without German or English skills because the refugees from 2016 translated to them. So they work as a multiplier. Not only IT courses are important for refugees. Refugees must be an orientation, an orientation in their mother tongue. Um, that is good with Labdu. We have a special Labdu image Ralph developed. It is 60 gigabytes big and has, um, I think, in 12 languages, 18 languages programs in 18 languages. This is very good. And we have stuff from Wikipedia. Ralph showed it before. And this is on the computers. The computers can be used for language training or listening training. If you make a certificate A1, A2, B1, which is necessary if you, look f if you are looking for a job, um, you have to make an examination and you hear something and have to write down something. And that is, you, you can do this only if you have the, the, possi the possibility to train this. And with this computer, the refugees can do. And what a very important thing is, refugees, many of the refugees don't have um, a personal folder. They have documents from the BAMF, this is the uh, government, the authority for the refugees, or documents from Arbeitsamt, this is the government um, that helps for jobs, and many personal documents um, everywhere. They have it in a desk, they have it in their shoes, they have it in a drawer, they have it in a box, or they threw it away. To have a personal folder, to put all this in a folder, that is very important. But if, for example, if you have an, um, an uh, uh, account statement from, uh, from a bank and you see what you get on money, you have to show it if you want to get money from the government. If you don't have it, it's a problem. But refugees don't know it. So we have to teach them how to handle with documents. Okay, and um, very important is 
that the refugees have the charm for relaxing. Listen music, watching videos, playing on computer games. When refugees come here, they are not allowed to work. They are in the refugee shelter in their room and have are often uh, uh, lazy, uh, not lazy, um, um, boring, boring time, have often a boring time. And if they have a computer, they can use it. Okay, when we, um, when we get computer to the refugees, we made a contract. We developed this life vertrag. This is a contract between us and between the refugees. And uh, on this contract, the computer is registered and the, the refugees sign the contract. Um, the UMAs are not allowed to sign it because they are not legally competent, because they are under 18 years old. So the legal guardian from youth office has to sign it. Um, we have nearly 90 computers outside from lab D. Yes, we have some negative experience. Um, the first is refugee work is very exhausting. I never imagined it before, but it's very exhausting. Um, about hardware resources, I told you, hard, enough hardware resources, but not enough helpers, teachers, and volunteers. Um, and not all refugees respect humans and respect hardware. Some refugees beat their wives and beat their children, and it's very difficult to handle this situation. And some refugees beat the hardware. One of the refugees threw one screen out of the window on the first floor. And we have not enough room. So when I saw the space in Switzerland, um, I think, oh, I would have this room, really. Um, we have not enough space and it's, um, it's difficult to make IT course in the same room, room where the installation and the maintenance of the computer is. Um, then another point is the secondary virtues, especially punctuation, reliability, are not very pronounced among the most refugees. When I say the, the course starts at nine o'clock, normally German people come at five minutes before nine. But refugees sometimes don't come or come at 10 o'clock or later. So it's really difficult to organize something. And one point is many refugees don't know copyrights. So when we started with working, they said, okay, we do it with Photoshop. I said, we don't have Photoshop, we have GIMP. Yeah, I have Photoshop. They are used to buy software for less than one euro in Afghanistan. You can buy any software for one euro. So this is an example of damaged devices. Um, we get back and have to repair if it's repairable. Yeah. And we have some technical challenges. Um, we have no internet in the shelters. That is really difficult, but thanks Labdu, refugee, refugee image, um, we had uh, a lot of offline content, and so they can't use the computer. The room that we have was too small. You saw a picture too small for a beamer and we had no monitor with a higher resolution, only a monitor with low re resolution. Uh, now we have internet, but it's with a ticketing system like in a hotel. That means we have a client separation and the computers cannot communicate together and cannot communicate with a network printer, for example. And 
Um, the vocational schools in Germany normally use Windows because they have a contract with Microsoft, Microsoft and they don't use um, Linux and they expect from their students that they use Windows too. So, we have some highlights. The children in the computer room are very, very happy if they can use the computer and go to the internet. Many of the UMAs develop very good the computing skills and the language skills. Some of them get an apprenticeship and can get an Ausbildungsduldung. Ausbildungsduldung means you are educated three years and work two years and in your profession that you learned and then you can stay in Germany, although you have no Asyl. And one highlight, of course, Trackmania Nations Forever runs fine with wine. I think you know that. So these are some impressions from the courses. From the courses. This is, uh, on the left side is my IT team and these are kids in the courses. And I say, thank you, let do. And questions for questions, I am the whole day here and you can ask later because of the time, Ralf, or... Thank you very much. Uh, I'm James uh, from London. Um, we, in England, we had challenges with refugees as well um, from Syria and I teach in a college in London and we had an enormous uh, number of young children with their parents coming from the war in Syria and also in Iraq during the war. And one of the challenges that we faced was that uh, before they can get into the English educational system, they should be able to speak the language. Yeah. If you can't read and write, you can't learn. Now, I want to find out some of the challenges, because if you have refugees coming to Germany, um, I presume that most of them won't be able to speak German language. So yes. how do you get them to get the language before you integrate them into the system for them to learn the courses that you're doing? Yes, um, we have uh, a special image, the refugee image, Ralph built, and we have 18 languages in this image. So, as soon as they can use a mouse and a keyboard, they can use the computer and they should read. Um, because we can switch it to Arabic language. Uh, maybe not only the content, but we put also videos when you come from an Arabic speaking country. We put about 100 lessons, learn German in Arabic language on it. Or if you have, uh, you should think about content, which is valuable for your need. And then I would recommend to build a Spanish refugee image, an English refugee image, a French one. Um, because the uh, software is more or less the same, but the added value is the content. And we put a German, uh, complete, we mirrored a complete website, learn German on it, 400 lessons is coming with a computer. The videos in Arabic language. So you should think about content, who will, which will help you to uh, integrate English speaking refugees. Uh, or not English-speaking refugees, um, but we cannot look for that. So it's your job to identify this content, or you ask about Romanian <laughs> content. We, I cannot talk Romanian, or I cannot uh, identify this content. I'm not familiar with UK and what's available there. And if, it, if so, everybody can modify uh, an image. I will show in a few minutes uh, what is possible, and then you can pr uh, prepare a copy of a computer ideal uh, for English integration of refugees. So it's, it's possible, but it's your job. You have to do the input, you know the need, and you have to look in the web what is helping you. And there, and there is one important point. The lab do image is possible to, uh, to switch the language to another country, to another language. But, but there is a one 
there is a point when the refugees speak the language, for example, German, in a good way, you should disable this switching off because then they should use it only in German to train the German all the time. We, we have a system, um, like you were talking, but the government stop it because they say it's costing the government a lot of money to put software and all these get people to train them. You have to pay them. And that, they stop it. So when the refugees come, we just put them in the school. So they have to sit with the other kids in the classroom and then they have to learn. Yeah. If the school is over, they have to... Yeah, so it's quite difficult for yeah. someone. So I think the lab do project would do quite a very good job if we can have a small yeah. cluster. We, of we cannot solve the problem of the British uh, social <laughs> system, um, but we do about 20% of our doing we do here in Germany locally. So when you get computer in, in London, um, then d you can decide to say, okay, give 10, 20, 30 percent I give to local projects for pupils, and the rest is going abroad. It's, it's your decision, and, and you can, can manage that. Okay, then I would like to um, change the plan a little bit. Um, I was asked about the installation tool, and just to, to give a, a short impression about this leptics, you have heard this. Uh, word several times today and you will you can watch it in the rooms today and even more in details tomorrow this is when you start the lab do installation environment it, we call it leptics and it gives you an incredible bunch of tools um, you can clone images to any computer you can check if the computer needs any um, sanitation or if anything is broken. You will have all this information here. You see all the details here. Um, what kind of computer is it? How many space is left? So all these information are available with just one or two clicks. And this tool is what we put on a CD. We can download it from our FTP server. It's completely for free. It's based on open source software. And tomorrow we go through the installation process if you want. So tomorrow we have several uh, presentation points and you can look for the English solution, French, German, etc. but also look for 3D printer or installation tool. This is just to give you an idea. It's um, not a wizard, it's just a <laughs> software tool. Okay. Um, uh, about the presentation I wanted to do, um, I got a lot of questions. Um, about batteries and other questions which came up when you transport uh, items. And so I put together a bunch of slides. It's not uh, the typical um, presentation. Uh, it is just a set of several questions I was asked from you and so I prepared these slides. When you pr um, transporting laptops, you have a battery inside, a lithium-ion battery. And um, if it's broken, if it's not quite good coated, um, then it might blow up in fire. This is very dangerous and so airplanes are very suspicious to transport laptops and there are, there are many regulations to, um, to control that, rules. Um, but first I would like to uh, explain how you calculate um, the strength of a battery because this measurement, the strength of the battery is an important criteria and it is not uh, the size of the charger. <laughs> we, um, we very often have this mistake when you have um, a charger you will, also you will also find volt and ampere on it but that is charger. We are on a, bat on a battery you have also um, volt and ampere and if you multiply it you will get the so-called watt hour, how many watt it can deliver within an uh, hour and this is the measurement. If it's below 100 you don't have to take care of anything. So there's a JATA rule that if the strength of a battery is below 100 you can transport it in your carry-on baggage, in your check baggage, or in any place you want. The problem is, 
Frank from Hub Bremen worked for British Airways. Um, JATA is making, is defining this standard, but not each uh, airline and not, not each airport is following this rule. So sometimes you have to check with your airline or with the airport, is it fine or will I get any problems? But in 99.9%, it is not making a problem if you have one, two, three laptops. If you have a complete box like these over there with seven, eight, ten laptops, then you will have a problem. Then, you, then there are other rules, but that is why LabDo is recommending to carry just a few numbers per person. Um, when you start sending laptops, then it's really got getting very complicated. It doesn't matter if it's by chip or by mm, airplane, air freight, um, then you need certain labels on your uh, package. It must be marked as there is a battery inside, it could be dangerous. This is just, this is the easiest slide I could find with, on one page for DHL with all the reg regulations for battery and it's it's as complicated as it looks like. Um, so if we extract it to the very basic, then you have to label the package and you have a limitation of five kilogram of battery per package. Mostly it's not a problem. If you have a battery, it's 100, 150 grams and you can pack a lot of uh, batteries before you uh, become more than, more than five kilogram. Um, but you should control each battery if there is a damage. And you need to be certified. If you send out large items like a Euro pallet or 100, 200 uh, computers, you need to be certified, as in German we say, Gefahrgutbeauftragter. That is a person who is uh, certified to handle dangerous goods. And, um, okay, another question was, we are using, this is now from Technik, we, we jump over to um, marketing. Google offers um, free advertise for charitable organization. Every association can claim for that, not in each country, and you must be a regi res registered um, association. Here you have the URL for German or English um, information, google.com grants. And the idea is that you don't pay for advertising, supporting your project. Uh, it is running on a budget of, um, of Google. You get monthly budget of $1,000. Uh, and even if you... Um, running out of this budget, they offer you even $10,000 per month. And it's really hard to get rid of this money. It's a really hard job, I will explain later, because um, when, you have, uh, when, you have, um, when you have a project like LabDo, then it is uh, not uh, static. Uh, you don't have a product. You cannot say, I want to sell you a drink or food or s something else. It's a virtual idea and it's really, really difficult. <coughs> what we uh, have, Google has certain regulations. So if you are thinking as well, uh, set asking for such a funding by Google, um, you have to fulfill a click-through rate of 5%. That means 20 visitors of your website, at least one should click on the advertise or, or looking for, for some services. So each 20th um, person seeing your ad, your advertise, should click on it and it's not uh, easy. You can see the red curve here. We, we started, this was about 5% uh, and then Google changed it. In the past it was just 1% one, 1 fulfillment, uh, click-through rate, and now we have to come up to 5, and now we are here close to 10, 13. So, but it was hard work to improve the ads for that. And by that we get about 100 computer donations and contacts per month, so it's really worth doing this job, but um, you have to have helpers being familiar with this concept and to improve this advertise just to explain. We don't, um, 
we don't uh, track all the information we could do from from our visitors, we only take the information, which country are you coming from? Because that is interesting for us, so we, we reduced it to a minimum of information. But as you can see, about one third of all users coming from Germany, um, United States, uh, Tanzania, Zambia, there are a lot of African countries now being aware, becoming aware of LabDo, and we can see this online every day, every hour, we can uh, track that. Uh, sometimes we see even the town where they started, but not more. We don't know the persons behind it, it's just to get some feedback for the work we're doing. Okay, next, next question was about why do you have so many um, do trips and so many partners in Germany and in other countries not? Um, what we do here is we do proactive contacting of other associations. That means we search the internet, is there uh, an association supporting a school in Nepal, in Africa, in Asia? And then we contact them and ask them, how about uh, laptops? Do you need laptops? And doing so, we got contact to Ghana, uh, Union Düsseldorf and many other associations. And they visit their projects regularly, once, two times, three times a year. And each time they can take laptops to the project. So we don't wait uh, because they contact us. We do kind of a partner management and um, we do a lot of small activities. I can't go through it like this here, dissemination partner management with companies um, because only when you spread the information then you can get feedback. If you say, here I am and please, please ask me, please contact me, nothing will happen, at least not so far. Um, we also... Um, do kind of a client management. You, you can hear that I, I come from, I was a businessman 40 years ago, I raised IT, IT companies in Europe and I was in the management of software houses uh, and the way Frank in Zurich and me are running this project is like a company. Um, for us, a user of a computer is a, or a donor is a client. They, they offer us a service, a donation and first thing we do is completely convince them that we are trustable. We keep our promises, we remove all data, and if we as a private association or private helper are not um, certified enough, then we use partners like AFB to do so. So we try to, uh, and this feedback is uh, very positive because one uh, convinced customer tells the next one and he's also donating his laptop. So it's uh, bringing up a new uh, donation. Transparency, of course, the platform itself is transparent uh, very well, uh, but we do something else. We publish our, where do we, we get our money from, where do we spend it for, so we, we, even if this is not German law, you don't have to do so, but we do um, to show any um, information about our association. We offer a lot of service, like picking up computers by AFB, uh, we have a car rental uh, arranged if someone has uh, 40 or 60 computers at a place where no other helpers are, then we uh, rent a car from by Zix mostly because Zix offering us a special uh, tariff uh, for social activities and so on. And our communication is in German. So um, when I, I said in the beginning on the home in the home page when you switch to German, you will read everyday language German, not a village, not, not these words. Um, it was a decision many, many years ago to name these, these parts in the project that way. Um, I can accept it, but in Germany, if I get a computer donation and I tell them, yes, give me your Deutronic, then he, what, I have a laptop. Uh, no, no, what are you talking about? And then the first problem is, um, there's a break in communication. And then I have to, no, no, it is because we name laptop is Deutronic and you know, and the chance that he said, okay, you're a strange guy, you're using strange words, is very, very big. That is, uh, that is the way why we completely cut it off. It, you will find it in some pages still in German, but we are working on it to eliminate these words and to come back to everyday words. But that is a, a decision for Germany, not in, un, in other languages. Okay. Um, so I think I stayed into my time limit. 
if you have other questions, um, if you want to know other things which I don't mention here, you can ask um, now or after that we have a round of travelers. There will be five, six travelers um, reporting about their experiences, bringing laptops abroad, what problems they were facing, how if, they, uh, if it were work well, we can also arrange the questions then. So it's up to you. Any questions now? Uh, because we recently received the contact about donations for laptops, but we have to pick up them ourselves.